Science moves forward, as always, and this month there is no shortage of new discoveries to report. So here are 10 interesting scientific discoveries for February 2025. Number 10. The Origin of the Dinosaur Killer One of Earth's most dramatic moments was the extinction of the dinosaurs brought about by the end Cretaceous asteroid impact. This impact, which occurred around the modern Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, left a crater that can still be detected geologically about 66 million years ago. This in turn, according to most scientists, drove the dinosaurs into a mass extinction with only one branch, the birds, surviving. The impact left a telltale marker in the overall geology of Earth, where exposures of it clearly show elevated iridium a metal linked to asteroids that otherwise is very rare on Earth, forming the boundary between the Cretaceous and Paleogene periods. But until recently, we knew very little about the actual asteroid itself or where it came from. But now we may have more. Researchers in Germany measured another metal deposited by the asteroid, ruthenium, and compared it to other impact craters on Earth along with some ruthenium ores from Earth. Ruthenium, like iridium, is rare in the Earth's crust, but abundant in asteroids. But those abundances actually vary based on where in the solar nebula the asteroid formed. Interestingly, the ruthenium deposits from the end Cretaceous geologic deposit were the same from every exposure of it worldwide, proving it was all from the same catastrophic event but also put the final nail in the coffin of volcanism as an alternative possible explanation for the event. This was an asteroid strike, and it's actually rather surprising what that asteroid was. The other impact craters studied showed that they were asteroids from the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, basically regular old asteroids tossed in our direction. The dinosaur killer was not. It actually appears to have been carbonaceous, which means it's likely to have been primitive material from an ancient asteroid belt somewhere beyond Jupiter in the outer solar system. Given that the delivery of carbon, water, and amino acids are also linked to such bodies, it seems that which favors life can be a double-edged sword. Just ask a Tyrannosaur. Number 9. AI Can Predict Rogue Waves Rogue waves are scary, and up until recently, it was debated whether they could even happen by scientists, even though sailors had been reporting them for centuries. Cresting as high as twice the height, or more, of normal surrounding waves, they basically represent an amplified wave when converging swells come together. It has been thought that these kinds of waves might have been predictable because certain patterns might precede them important because these kinds of waves are being increasingly implicated in deaths and ship losses at sea. But no algorithm anyone could develop had any luck predicting them until now. Using over 16 million data points collected by ocean buoys, researchers at the University of Maryland were able to train an AI to detect the telltale wave patterns that precede rogue waves. And it turns out it predicted three out of four waves as much as five minutes in advance. And it was even able to predict them in areas where it had no training data, suggesting that an early warning system for ocean navigation is a viable possibility in the not too distant future. Number eight, a link between odd radio circles and galactic mass mergers. A member of a class of relatively recently discovered radio phenomena known as odd radio circles or orcs known as the Cloverleaf, has been linked with a huge galactic merger. Astronomers using the E. Rosita telescope to observe an X-ray observed the Cloverleaf, which is about 600 million light years from Earth, and found that the environment was chaotic, including shockwaves and black hole activity, helping to unlock how the Cloverleaf formed. Turns out it seems to be a huge merger of 12 different galaxies, essentially at once, linked to the odd radio circle emissions. First discovered in Australia using the Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder, these mysterious circles of radio emission had been previously unexplained, and subsequently a total of eight of them are now known. 
they are actually larger than galaxies overall, and if they are due to galactic mass mergers, the origin would be hot gas wafting between the galaxies, and the acceleration of cosmic rays within the galaxies causing increased emissions. Trouble is, not all huge galaxy mergers do this, so some parts of the mystery remain. Number 7. Spiders Lure Prey with Fireflies who could forget last month's list and the revelation of the octopus that punches unhelpful fish while using compliant fish to aid in hunting? This month we have another. This time it's fireflies. Members of the species Epsgondita terminalis, native to Asia, are known to exhibit the behavior where a female will flash a single time, whereas the males release multiple light flashes to attract mates. Cuin, a type of orb weaver spider, known as Irenaeus ventricosus. A recent study in China showed that these spiders somehow are able to coerce male fireflies stuck in their webs to flash more like females, far less frequently, which in turn lures other males into the web, allowing the spider to build up a supply of food. The study involved sticking the male fireflies in the webs and either leaving them to the mercy of the spider or removing the spider as a control to see what the difference was. The fireflies responded to the spider and apparently did its bidding, yet when put in the webs of other species of spider, this did not happen. When the research painted the fireflies so the flashing was invisible, the effect stopped and the spider did not get to stock up on emergency rations. Number 6. Another spider is a fan of an extinct sloth. This is odd. Recently in Brazil, an entirely new species of spider was discovered, known as Peliotoca diminos. This is basically a cave spider that no one knew about until recently, but it's a weird one in the sense of the type of cave it chooses to inhabit. It's actually the burrows of extinct megafauna, such as the giant ground sloth and the giant armadillo, both of which have been extinct since prehistory. The burrows are in the Minas Gerais region of Brazil, and the tiny 2mm spiders lack eyes, but have hairs that sense vibrations like many spiders do, which serves as a proxy for sight. Oddly, the name of the spider, Paleotoka, means old house, which is fitting. But other than that, this newly discovered spider is poorly understood as of yet. Number 5. The Advent of Broader Anti-Venom Against Snake Bites Snakebite anti-venom medications have changed very little since their advent over 130 years ago. Each one is limited typically to a single species, which means treatment is problematic if you don't know what snake actually bit the victim. And the way anti-venom meds are made is through the use of animal antibodies, usually, which can provoke dangerous immune responses in humans being treated. Anti-venom researchers have been hoping to change this with broader treatments for some years, and now there may be a breakthrough, which will be especially important in tropical nations with high populations of multiple poisonous snakes, something that globally kills upwards of 100,000 people per year worldwide. The new anti-venom is known as 95MAT5, and it is an antibody that combats toxins common to many snakes and instead of being animal-derived, it's human-derived, lowering the chances of allergic reactions. The big problem was that snake toxins aren't singular. They are all kinds of different toxins in a single snake, and many more across multiple species, making it more like treating cancer than counteracting a poison. The new anti-venom targets a type of protein, known as three-finger toxins, that act on the nervous system, and are common to many snakes, including mambas, cobras, and others. This presents the very dangerous paralysis in mice that is often a deadly factor in snake bite deaths overall. Basically, the anti-venom acts like a sponge, presenting the same type of receptor that the toxins would normally bind to, soaking them up as it were. And since it relied on the shape of a receptor, the hope is that this can be broadened to other snake toxins, opening the possibility of the drug becoming a kind of one-size-fits-all cocktail to treat snake bites. Number 4. Pluto and Charon may have been a contact binary. For such a tiny world, Pluto has a lot of moons, five of them, 
and the largest is Charon, which is half the radius of Pluto itself. One of the great mysteries of the Pluto system, however, has been how Charon ended up there. And one idea has been that Pluto was impacted at some point and Charon coalesced out of the debris. But that may not be correct, as it turns out. New simulations done at the University of Arizona show that Charon may actually have been a capture, where Proto-Charon may have come directly into contact with Pluto, and the two bodies remained touched together for about 10 hours, spinning rapidly. After that, Charon parted ways, and settled gently into an orbit around Pluto. The problem is, this doesn't explain the complex geology of these two worlds very well, so much more work in understanding that system is needed. Number 3. New Insights on the Meteor Afterglow Phenomenon I'd imagine there is no shortage of meteor watchers in this audience, and I am no exception. Whether there is a meteor shower or not, I'm always looking up at night. And one thing that's impossible not to notice after enough sky watching is that some meteors, especially bright ones, leave visible trains that hang in the sky for some time after the meteor itself is gone. Yet not all of the bright ones do this. People have been seeing these trains for the entirety of our existence and scientists have been interested for over a century. But a lot of questions have persisted as to just what's going on with these trains and their variability, and it turns out it has something to do with altitude. A recent survey of these trains shows that it actually doesn't have anything to do with brightness or speed, just where in the atmosphere the train is left. What happens is the metals burn off the meteor when it falls and react with oxygen, especially ozone and it's that chemical reaction that produces the train by emitting light. The altitudes involved required the meteors to descend to about 90 kilometers or lower to react with the ozone and leave a persistent trail, with some of the trails in the study lasting as long as an hour, though this is still above the ozone layer. So it's a matter of as soon as ozone availability is there, the train happens. Part of the problem in studying this is that it's hard to constrain just how much ozone is available, because the needed altitude is too low for satellites, but too high for balloons to take reliable measurements, meaning that studying the meteor trains may yield insights on that lesser understood area of the atmosphere. Number 2. Dolphins may hear with their teeth. Dolphins have interesting teeth, to the point that many of them aren't even used for chewing. Researchers in Japan have taken a closer look at the jaw anatomy of dolphins, to better understand what's actually going on there, along with certain species of whale that also have features similar to dolphins. And then they compared them to the jaws of domestic pigs, obviously a very different species. It turns out that the dolphin's teeth actually sit more loosely in the jaw than land mammals and the underlying structure holding the teeth is spongier than on land. Moreover, there were long bundles of nerve fibers spread throughout these areas, suggesting that the dolphins have weirdly heightened sensitivity in their teeth. It turns out that the dolphin teeth are actually comparable to tactile hairs in land mammals that use them to detect touch very sensitively. The findings are inconclusive, but suggest that it may be the case that dolphin teeth actually aid in their hearing underwater, something that only can be demonstrated through further study of dolphin behavior in relation to their teeth. Number 1. Carbon Dioxide Glaciers and Water on Mars It's no secret that Mars once had abundant liquid water. The evidence is everywhere, from its mineralogy to its ancient river channels. But there have been lingering questions about how Mars managed to keep that liquid water for so long in the form of river channels. Some estimates say it had it for well over a billion years, at least. The question is, how did it sustain it? And we may have an answer. Carbon dioxide. Mars should have lost its liquid water faster than it did. And what actually melted it to sustain rivers so long was always unclear. Mars is small. It lost most of its atmosphere quickly and is further from the warmth of the sun, leading some scientists to suggest that some kind of warming event happened that sustained the moving water. But that may not be the case. Instead, it may have been the opposite. Carbon dioxide glaciers. Those are still happening today. 
So Mars wobbles on its axis. Its current poles at various times actually may at times have been pointing at the Sun. That wobble drives the carbon cycle on geologic scales. So when the equator is getting the majority of the sunlight, carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere and then condenses into ice at the poles on top of subsurface water ice. When the poles are warmed by the wobbling, the carbon dioxide there evaporates and the equator gets the condensation and ice caps. So if you go back when Mars was much younger and had more water and a thicker atmosphere, at the time when the river channels and such were active, it turns out that the frozen carbon dioxide caps over water insulated and produce pressure that traps heat, melting the water and allowing for the rivers that formed the channels we see today. And so concludes this 10 list, but I include an extra bonus oddity. So everyone knows that the Arecibo radio telescope collapsed in 2020, destroying it. Well, the report on just what happened is out, and it's weird. So the cables holding up the central platform suspended over the dish were held in sockets that were filled with zinc. The zinc experienced a deformation and creep and eventually the whole thing failed. But get this, the rate of zinc creep was way faster than it should have been. And all the investigators could come up with to explain that is that Arecibo's radio transmitter, the most powerful on Earth when it existed, and was how it was able to radar asteroids and send out the Arecibo message, actually created an electric field so strong that it allowed for the accelerated zinc deformation. The telescope's ability to transmit as well as receive may have been its undoing. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently giving some good news. As many listeners know, I was concerned about the cancellation of the Chandra X-ray Observatory due to NASA budget cuts even though that observatory has another 10 years of operation left in it. You can hear an Event Horizon episode I did with Dr. David Pooley on that subject, the link in the description below. Turns out though, public outcry worked, and Chandra got a one-year reprieve in November. And now there's time for the US Congress to give it special line-item funding as Hubble gets. It may not be done for after all, but Americans keep writing Congress and visit the Save Chandra website for more information, link below. The chance to keep high-resolution X-ray astronomy going for another decade is still there. More time has been bought, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.